and thank you all who have presented. I have to say I've, I've found the conference these last two and a half days extremely interesting, but more so, more than, and more importantly, actually, I found it very inspiring. And uh, to hear the good work that all of you are doing is, um, for me at least, uh, it's really heartening. So um, when, when Lou asked me to, uh, to talk about, and I think, I think the way he put it was something like uh, personal reflections on the impact of my professional activities, it produced two sorts of anxieties, actually, in, uh, in me. One was uh, that I'm just unsure how to measure the impact of my work. And however I measure it, the second, the second anxiety, I have strong suspicions that um, by any reasonable measure, the impact hasn't been very great at all. And the, the problems of measurement, I think, are, are due to the means of impact. So, consider the following. Um, in our role as researchers and writers, our impact is mediated by our audience. Has anyone who's read something that I've published done anything to improve global poverty or inequality? I don't know. Have my writings contributed to the broader discussion in such a way that some of the listeners of that discussion have had an impact? I really don't know. Or think about our role as teachers. Has Anybody who's taken a class from me had any impact on anything to improve global poverty and inequality? Well, here I do know a little bit. I know of a few cases that um, I'm proud of, but in general, I don't know. The vast majority of my students, I don't know what they end up doing. So I have, uh, I have a great deal of lack of confidence about my own impact and the impact that my professional activities have had. These, these two capacities of of teaching and lecturing that, um, that, that are sort of central to my work are very much unlike the medical work performed by organizations such as Partner in Health, Partners in Health. They can measure their impact in services delivered and children vaccinated and lives saved. Their activities are unmediated um, in a way that, um, that mine just aren't. In, in some ways, I think my activity is much more like the activity of a donor, a donor to, some, to, to organizations like Partner in Health. It's mediated by what other people do, and it may or may not have impact. Moreover, for some of us, myself at least, and I think suspect others, we've, we've been convinced that what's needed is not just immediate relief from severe poverty, although that's very good when it occurs, but institutional and policy change is needed. And there, although there may be an obvious indicator of impact when policy change occurs, we can't be at all sure that we've played any significant role in bringing that about, at least in many cases, at least I can't be, and some of you probably can be more sure than I can because you've had direct experience with the people who've changed the policies in a way that I just haven't. Finally, there's, there are just disciplinary constraints. I'm a moral and political philosopher, and in philosophy, impact has largely to do with whether or not one gets an article published in a good journal. That's how it's typically measured. And Perhaps also whether one manages to convince a half a dozen of one's colleagues of some what seems like totally implausible idea that it might actually be uh, plausible. There might be some sort of argument in support of that idea. So impact is measured within the discipline in a way that's very much unlike, I think, the impact that most of us are concerned with here. So my strong and educated suspicion is that my impact regarding global poverty has been small and not particularly exemplary because my energies have been directed to research and writing for mainly for philosophical journals and teaching courses in philosophy. So if it's true that the point is to change the world, this is not a particularly direct way, teaching and doing research in philosophy I don't think is a particularly direct way to do that. So I'm here mostly to learn from you about how I might adapt my professional activities and energies to have greater impact and I have to say I've, I've learned uh, considerably in the last uh, in the last couple of days, and I'm thankful for that. But I will say a few words about my professional activities, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll focus these on three areas. One is teaching, the other is institutional building, and finally, um, research and writing. So let me say a few words first about teaching. And here I, I'm thinking, um, I guess my comments are mostly directed towards the the younger members of the audience who are at the beginning of teaching careers teach, or, or academic careers. Um, I think um, there are a number of questions to ask yourself when you think about the kind of activity that you might want to have um, in 
your teaching careers and the kind of impact that you might want to have in your teaching careers. One obvious question is simply what to teach. And here I would say that you shouldn't shy away from teaching analytically rigorous material in, say, courses like the history of philosophy or um, metaethics and normative ethics. I think, that, I think that those courses actually have impact. They have the impact in the sort of mediated way that I'm talking about, but you transfer or you produce a set of skills in students that, um, to borrow and perhaps misuse a phrase, are all-purpose means. The analytic skills that students get from those sorts of courses I think are very important and they can use them to have the kind of impact that a lot of us would like to see. But of course, obviously, I also don't think that those are the only co kinds of courses that one ought to teach if one has, wants to have impact. And I've taught, um, I've taught courses in, in applied ethics and in global justice and in climate change and justice, all of which I think are important as well. Um, and I would urge you also to think about teaching those sorts of courses, but I think I'm preaching to the converted there and I don't really need to make, um, make that point. It's also, though, I think important to think about who to teach. And here I think it's important it's particularly important to teach undergraduates. Um, I've spent most of my teaching career teaching undergraduates. Um, I've spent most of my teaching career at um, teaching institutions. And one of the things that's important, I think, about teaching undergraduates is you're, just not, you're not just reproducing your discipline, um, but rather you're teaching people who are going to go out and do very interesting things in some cases. And you can have an influence on what they may end up doing. So um, the, the, um, the role that we can play as undergraduate educators, I think, um, is important. It's also, I think, worth thinking about where you're going to teach, um, where geographically you're going to locate yourself. The best and most satisfying teaching experience that I had was the six and a half years that I spent at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, where I learned tremendously from my students. This was from 1996 to 2002, and the institution was going through a dramatic, a dramatic change of democratization. The institution was flooded. Um, by students from the townships and we were trying to accommodate them in our classrooms and it was an amazing experience. I learned a tremendous amount from, uh, from my students but also from my colleagues about how to try to deliver the educational services that we needed to deliver in a very, um, very difficult situation. And I think if I had significant uh, impact as a teacher, that's probably where I had it. Um, yeah, I also learned a lot about global justice during um, those years and it informed, certainly informed my first book. So um, teaching is important, and I think it's something that we um, perhaps we don't think um, that much about when we think about impact. We haven't talked a lot about it today, although I'm glad that some of my colleagues previous, uh, in the previous presentations have said a little bit about it. Let me say something about institution building. If you, if you find yourself in the opportunity to be the director of an institution at a university, you have something that's enviable. You have something that most academics won't have in their career, which is resources. And those resources might just be the institutional status or prestige that you have associated with being the director of, 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 uh, a, uh, of a center, but it might also be money. And you can use those resources to have impact. Uh, the kind of impact that you can have uh, is varied. It can be an impact on the local community, the, the educational institution that you're a part of. You can affect the debates, the discussions that go on there. You can uh, have an impact on the education of students that you might not have in the classroom but that might attend your events. But you can also, I think, interestingly, have impact on the discipline because you can decide or you can help decide who to promote, who to bring to your campus, whose work to try to showcase, and whose work to try to encourage. And that's, um, that's an, I think, an, an important job within the academic community. I was, for 11 years, the, um, the founding director of the Institute for Ethics and Public Affairs at San Diego State University. And I'll read you just a brief uh, segment of the mission statement from the Institute for Ethics and Public Affairs. The Institute for Ethics and Public Affairs at San Diego State University seeks to promote critical thinking about moral issues that are often complex in nature. The Institute aims to be a resource to members of the campus community, the largest, larger community of scholars and, greater, and the greater San Diego community who wish to pursue thoughtful discussion and research as a means of clarifying moral problems. The, the Institute for Ethics and Public Affairs wasn't, strictly speaking, a global justice institute. It had a broader mandate than that. But because of my own interests, we did a lot of things that were associated with global justice. We operated on a modest budget of about $20,000 a year, and I had the, um, the help of a graduate student, uh, assistant who worked for me uh, 10 hours a week. And we organized student essay writing contests. 
We had lunchtime discussions, we had lecture series, and we had symposia, and we also tried to encourage students to get involved in various sorts of service learning projects. Um, just to give you an indication of some of our activities, in 2003 and 2004, we had a lecture series called Global Justice and Glo Global Governance that included speakers such as Richard Falk, Thomas Frank, Kai Nielsen, Thomas Poga, and others. And in 2004, we had a pre-election symposium called Democracy and Inequality, which looked at the distortions to democracy that socioeconomic inequality causes. And uh, for that symposium, we had Joshua Cohen, Jay Mandel, and Nadine Strossen of the American Civil Liberties Union. 2004 and 2005, we had a symposium called Global Justice and Climate Change, and we invited Robert Atfield, Robin Atfield, Stephen Gardner, Paul Harris, Tim, ha Tim Hayward, Dale Jameson, and Henry Hsu. In 2008, we had a symposium called Global Egalitarianism, Theory and Practice. Um, we brought Simon Caney, A.J. Julius, Branko Milanovic, Felipe Van Paris, Van Paris and Kachor Tan to present. In 2009-2010, we had a lecture series called The Future of International Climate Change, uh, The Future of International Climate Change Agreement that included Richard Somerville, Steve Vanderheiden, and Paul Baer. And in 2012, we sought, um, with the cooperation of the, uh, of the Center for Global Justice at UCSD, we sought to introduce the local community to academic stands against poverty and to the global, uh, to the Health Impact Fund, and Thomas Pogge spoke again at that. Now, there are a number of challenges. I should, well, let me, let me, say, let me say something about the nature of, of that institution, um, and then I'll speak of the challenges. San Diego State University is part of the California State University System, and the mission of the California State University System is primarily teaching. Um, so at the CSU, we have very few, um, almost no PhD students, and a great many of our students are from working class families, um, first generation students, immigrant, uh, children of immigrant families, and in San Diego, of course, a number of our students cross the border every day to attend our classes, and they could get stuck in traffic for um, for two or more hours just crossing the border. And this made audience building very, very difficult because the students were very busy. Um, and it's, it was a constant frustration and it's something that uh, if you get involved in the, um, the area of, of institution building, I think you'll, you'll have to figure out how it is that you can build audiences to attend events where you're bringing in very good speakers, speakers you really think people should hear, uh, and people just don't turn up. Um, and you have to, you'll have to think about all sorts of tricks that you might use if you teach at that sort of an institution. I think if you teach at other kinds of institutions, you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, let me say something about the failures of that time. Um, and I think that um, there's something that can be learned from, uh, from the failures of, of that effort. One is I think that we, we just consistently failed to have as much student involvement in the center, in the institute, as we should have had. We did, as I said, try to involve students in service learning projects, um, but we didn't do it, we, we didn't have as much student involvement as I think would have been desirable, and uh, if we'd had more, we would have had a greater impact, I think, on the lives of students in a way that um, we would have liked to have seen. So I would urge you, if you're involved in these efforts, if you have an opportunity to be involved in these efforts, to think seriously and creatively about how to draw students into them on a consistent and regular basis. We also, um, we also failed, I think, um, because of the nature of this particular institution and the way in which this, uh, this center came to exist at the institution, I failed, I think, to initiate the kind of broad cooperation amongst my colleagues that would have sustained the institute um, after I left. I, I have no idea what the nature or what the, uh, what the future of the institution will be when I leave, now that I've left, but it arose in a context in which there was a great deal of acrimony about the very existence of the Institute. And I, I didn't trust a number of my colleagues to actually participate in a way that would be, um, well, helpful to, the, helpful to the existence and the organization of its efforts. So I tended to isolate myself and do things on my own, which was fun. I got to do what I wanted to do, but I think in terms of the long, the, the long-term perspective of the health of, or the, of the maintenance of, of this kind of a center, now that I've left, I think it's in question. Um, all right, uh, so let me say something about my current, uh, the current institution that I'm at, and then I'll say something about teaching, I mean, sorry, about, uh, about research and writing. This isn't a, this, I can't tell you anything about institutional building here, but I'm now 
a member of normative orders at Goethe University. I didn't build it. I had no role in building it. Um, normative orders is an inter interdisciplinary research unit and is funded by the German Research Foundation. Its directors are Reiner Forst and Klaus Gunther. Um, normative orders received initial funding in 2007 and renewal from the, the German Research Fund in 2012. It's a large multidisciplinary research unit comprising philosophers, political scientists, uh, economists, sociologists, ethnologists, legal theorists, and theologians. It's also not a global justice center, but its orientation involves an effort to assess the manifold processes of globalization critically. So part of normative order self-description runs as follows, and I'll just I'll read you this from, from the web page. Whether it's a matter of a just social order under conditions of globalization, and new technological possibilities or a just global order in the face of scarce resources, climate change, and armed conflict, we are confronting challenges of a new kind that cannot be met with traditional conceptions of order. In a world of different cultural self-understandings and traditions, transnational norms and institutions are emerging whose validity is being and must be placed in question. Researchers at Normative Orders analyze these processes from the perspective of the formation of normative orders. They see the processes and conflicts in question not merely as facts and phenomena to, to be described in functionalist terms. Instead, they, they inquire into the normative conceptions which play a role in this context and thus confront in the process of, uh, and, and, thus con, and, and, thus, sorry, and thus confront and in the process transform one another. As I said, it's a very large organization. There are 32 principal researchers and there are a variety of research programs. I can't claim any credit for the activities of normative orders, um, but due in part to the interests of Reiner Forst and Stefan Gozapat, who recently left uh, Goethe University for the Free University of Berlin, there been a, there's been a great deal of energy put into concerns of global justice and global, um, and global poverty, both by professors, by postdocs, and by graduate students. I did a little uh, brief survey of some of the publications that have come out of the normative orders in the last several years, and I. I counted something like 28 publications in areas related to global justice and global poverty in the last several years. It's also hosted a great many events on themes related to our concerns, the concerns that we've been discussing these past two uh, days. I'll mention just two. Um, one is a symposium called Human Rights Today that, uh, that was organized in May 2010, and it included a number of prominent speakers on uh, human rights, including um, Abdullah Amis Naim, Susan Baer, Etienne Balibar, Charles Bites, Sheila Ben Habib, Kostas Duzinias, and John Tas uh, Tasulusas. Sorry, John Tasulas, thank you. Um, um, in, uh, in 2012, there was, an or there was a symposium on global justice and, uh, that included speakers such as Alan Buchanan, Simon Caney, Katrine Flickshu, Catherine Liu, David Miller, Thomas Poga, Andrea San Giovanni, Henry Shu, and Melissa Williams. It's a very dynamic place. There's constantly uh, events of this sort going on. And it also cooperates with another Frankfurt-based research effort called Justitia Amplificata that in December 2012 organized a workshop called Justice and Development. And at that workshop, um, there were, again, an impressive uh, set of speakers, including uh, Nira Chandoki, um, Martha Nussbaum, Sanjay Reddy, Ingrid, Rob Ingrid Robbins, and others. And Reiner Forrest, who is uh, one of the leaders of, norm of normative orders, has uh, developed a Leibniz Prize research group on transnational justice that I think is going to be very interesting. Um, it, will it will provide a valuable role in encouraging and incorporating research done by political theorists and philosophers in the developing world. So let me, um, let me just uh, close by saying a few things about research and writing. Um, I think that, that we s try to serve two masters in our writing, oftentimes at least, or people involved in political philosophy um, who are interested in these things try to serve two masters. One is we try to make a contribution that's going to be acknowledged by our peers in the discipline, and uh, we hope that we will have an effect on a debate that is fairly narrow with respect to our discipline and our efforts will be held in esteem by our peers. And we also try to make a broader contribution to people who are interested in a number of these perspectives or a number of these issues from a more interdisciplinary perspective. I think that's well and good. I think that we should try to do that. I've certainly tried to do it in my own writing, but there's also there can also be a tension in doing that. Um, it can be the case that uh, 
the more you try to impress and satisfy your peers, the less you're going to have to, uh, the less ability you're going to have to speak to that broader audience. And it's something that I think we all um, struggle with in our, um, in our writing. Let me, in closing, let me just uh, reflect on the state of the discipline as, um, or at least one aspect of the state of the discipline as I see it. In the mid 80s, when I was a graduate student uh, in philosophy, the field of global justice didn't exist. I was busy writing a dissertation on Hegel's philosophy of subjective spirit, and I wasn't particularly interested in bringing together my activism and my philosophical life. I was happy that they were separate. With the exception of a few philosophers, like Peter Singer and Henry Hsu, there was very little interest among philosophers in issues, in issues that relate to what we now call global justice. There was very little being done in the way of publication in these areas. And then people began to write about global justice, and now it's a large and well-respected sub-discipline within philosophy. It seems to capture the interests of a great many bright young researchers, and I think that that's terrific. Thomas has played a particularly large role, I think, in that change. But all of us who have participated in these debates have been part of a process of change within the discipline. Uh, and it's a discipline now which is much more willing to look at our social world and the world around it and to direct its important tools to, of argument analysis to that world. And that, I think, is some sort of impact that we've all had. And that's all I have to say. Thank you.